Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. It was in 2009, and I went camping with my boyfriend somewhere along the Appalachian Trail. I'm still convinced that what we saw was absolute evil in its purest form, and I don't want to say exactly where we were because I don't want anyone to get any ideas about going there in search of this entity. I've always enjoyed being in the woods and that's one of the reasons my boyfriend and I meshed so well together. We met when we were both at the same two-week-long spiritual retreat and realized we had so much in common. The retreat went well, and after six months of being together, I moved to the Midwest to be closer to him. I was born and raised in Maine, but because I can work from anywhere and he can't, I decided to make the sacrifice of moving. It ended up working out, and once I moved there, he showed me a whole other part of the country and a whole different type of wilderness than anything that I was used to. We are also both very interested in the paranormal and love to take ghost tours all over the place. On this particular trip, though, we were just trying to unwind from a long week of work, from the stress of my move, and just from everyday life as 20-somethings just starting to make and find our way in the world. The campsite he chose was spectacular, and I knew right away it was going to be a great time. We had one very large tent that we were sharing, and he knew more about the outdoors than I did. And that's saying something, because I was basically raised in the wilderness. Family vacations were always spent camping, hiking, or doing some other amazing activity outdoors. And as a family, we built a fire, had some dinner, and after stargazing for about an hour, we decided to go into the tent and call it a night at around midnight. Aside from the fact that we saw what looked like several shooting stars, only they were bright, glowing green. There was nothing creepy or off-putting about the forest up until that point. It was almost like the second we got into our tents and got settled in, we both felt like the energy of the whole place had just shifted somehow. We couldn't put our fingers on it at first, but eventually we decided that although we couldn't hear anything and there wasn't anything there that we could see, we felt like we were being watched by something right outside of our tent. It was terrifying because we had both been looking into encounters in the woods right before we left for this trip. We were planning on camping for a week, but after that first night, we decided to move and find somewhere else to set up our camp. We hardly got any sleep, and it wasn't only because of the eerie feelings we both had when we finally laid down either. The entire night, we kept being woken up by a child yelling and pleading for help. Of course, we grabbed our flashlights and went out into the woods to look for the little girl we were hearing, but we never found anyone. It just gave us a bad feeling. I mean, why would there be a little girl yelling for help in the middle of the woods, out in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the night? It didn't make any sense. After the fourth time, we didn't even bother to go and look anymore. And honestly, we both felt like something was trying to lure us deeper into the forest. 
I always look back on that night and on that trip and thank heaven that he and I both were very aware of not only the fact that paranormal entities oftentimes stalk wooded areas and especially forests, but that they will lure you to your death sometimes as well. Who knows what would have happened to us if we hadn't given up for the night. It depends on what you're dealing with, and honestly, whether or not you believe. There weren't any other people camping in the area where we were, or at least we didn't see anyone, and there shouldn't have been. The woods were very isolated and out of the way, and so we didn't expect to see anyone. When we heard a little girl, we knew something just wasn't right. We hardly slept, and first thing the next morning, we had some breakfast and then hiked two miles further into the woods in the hopes that we wouldn't have to deal with whatever was happening at the initial campsite. We weren't freaked out enough to give up on the trip, and since the paranormal was kind of our thing, we were sort of exhilarated by the experience. Not enough to investigate, but enough that we thought it was going to be a cool and creepy story to tell our friends. We hung out and hiked a bit, and eventually it was time to go to bed again. All had been quiet up until that point, and we hadn't seen or heard anyone else anywhere near us. Sure enough, though, as soon as we got into the tent, that eerie and creepy feeling came over the both of us again, and we somehow just knew that we hadn't heard the last of the little girl. We felt whatever it was, it was extremely negative. Therefore, we didn't try to record or photograph anything in any way. We hadn't seen it yet, but I wish we had set up our cameras. We were equipped to have gotten the activity on video, but we just felt like that would have caused us more trouble. We kissed goodnight and went to sleep, hoping for the best, but expecting to be woken up all night long again. We weren't wrong in having that expectation. Sure enough, right around two in the morning, we heard a little girl crying. She wasn't yelling or screaming for help that time, but she was moaning and crying like she was really sad. Of course, this tugged at our heartstrings, despite knowing what we were both feeling intuitively and also what we had obviously gone through the night before. We were considering leaving and calling the police. There was no cell service in that area anyways, even if we had cell phones, which we didn't at the time. After about 15 minutes of incessant crying and moaning, we had finally had enough and gave in. We grabbed our flashlights and went to look for the little girl. Neither of us expected to find a little girl, but we had to look just in case there was one who needed help. It was highly unlikely, I know, but it's hard to explain how you react to something like this when you're in the moment. We tried to follow the sounds of where the cries seemed to be coming from. After about 20 minutes of randomly walking in the woods, we were about to give up and go back to our tent. We had made the decision that the next day we were going to go into town and report it to the local authorities. Turns out, we would have no reason to do any such thing. Suddenly, the forest went silent and grew very still. The cries stopped as we stood directly in front of a really tall and wide tree. It was much taller than any of the others around it, and the front of it looked like it had some sort of strange carvings or symbols on it. We hadn't remembered seeing it earlier in the night, despite it seeming like it would be really hard to miss. And we had circled back around to that area at least twice. 
there was a grayish white fog starting to form around the tree and all over the place in the area where we were standing. It engulfed everything, and it was suddenly very hard to see. He and I were both really scared right away because we knew this was not normal and the fog wasn't a natural phenomenon. I couldn't see my boyfriend, but I could hear him, and he told me to just stay still so we could think of how to get out of there without losing one another. I reached for his hand and he grabbed it, or so I thought. I heard him ask where I was and I told him right here, meaning I was holding his hand. He asked me right where, and that's when I told him I was holding his hand. He said I wasn't doing any such thing, and that's when it hit me how far away he sounded. I immediately tried to let go of who or whatever's hand I was holding, but it clenched its hand around mine and squeezed. I screamed in pain and terror. I looked over in that direction and saw a creature next to me. I could somehow see through the dense and very intense fog. It was about ten feet tall, white like the color of a crayon labeled as white, not Caucasian or even just pale, and it had extremely large black eyes. The eyes reminded me of a cat. They stared into mine, and I felt myself start to get dizzy. I wanted to take in more of the creature before it led me to whatever fate it had in store for me. It had what looked like an antenna on top of its head, and there was a green light emanating from its whole body, all around it. Its fingers were long and spindly, but they were circular at the end. Instead of having fingernails, there seemed to only be circular little nubs at the tips. I kept trying to pull my hand away, but its grip was too tight. I also noticed it had a nose, and the shape of where the eyebrows went and formed the nose that also reminded me of a cat. Its mouth looked perfectly normal. I screamed, and that must have been when I passed out. However, I didn't hit the ground because the entity wouldn't let go of my hand. It simply jerked my arm back up, and I was once again standing normally, and it had my full attention. I yelled for my boyfriend, but got no response. The fog had lifted. I tried to look around to see if I could locate him, but I also didn't want to take my eyes off the being that had me by the hand and didn't seem to have any intentions on letting go anytime soon. A bright blue light blasted out of the sky right in front of us. It almost blinded me, and I used my other hand to shield my eyes. I looked over at the being, and its mouth opened unusually wide, and it reminded me of a snake who dislocated its jaw when about to or in the middle of devouring its prey. I screamed again, but it just mimicked me and screamed my voice back at me. I was shaking, and I stopped walking and stubbornly stood there. I was overwhelmed with and overcome by fear and complete and total panic. I didn't know what to do. Suddenly and seemingly out of nowhere, I was being pulled backwards by two strong arms around my waist. It was my boyfriend, and it looked like he had been swimming or something because he was soaking wet. His brave attempt at freeing me had caught the creature off guard and it lost its grip on my hand. The light from the sky vanished, the remaining fog went with it, and the creature turned to us and angrily howled. Then, as we watched, it floated right into the trees and disappeared. Within minutes, we could hear the sounds of a little girl crying and calling out for help. We ran as fast as we could, but we had no idea where our camp was. We were lured out there and didn't remember how far we had gone or which way we had come from. 
We ran and ran regardless, and eventually we did make it back to our camp. We couldn't leave right then because it was the middle of the night, and there were other known predators out there that could attack and kill us. We had to wait it out. We got back into our tent, and honestly, we didn't even talk about it. We were both so incredibly exhausted probably from the extreme rushes of adrenaline that we both just cuddled up and passed out. We woke up at 10 the next morning. We got out of our tent, intent on packing everything up immediately and hiking back out of there. However, we got out of the tent and realized we were right under the gigantic, strange tree where the entity had disappeared into. Our entire camp, our tent, all of our belongings, everything had somehow been transported while we slept to that spot. We knew right then that something otherworldly had happened to us, but we had no idea what. We just wanted to get the heck out of there, and so we did. We talked about it a little bit, but my boyfriend, who is now my husband, wouldn't ever open up to me about where he had gone that night or why he came back soaking wet. It's too traumatic, I guess, and I hope that someday he will feel like he can tell me. We both believe wholeheartedly that we had been abducted and that it more than likely wasn't the first or the last time. We are also pretty sure we aren't the only ones. We are both considering hypnotic regression therapy, but we aren't quite ready yet. Either together or individually, we are both still very fearful of what we might uncover. I put this out there in the hopes that other people who have experienced something similar, whether out in the woods or in that same area or otherwise, won't feel so alone and afraid. My boyfriend and I never discussed what happened to us with anyone other than each other. It just seems safer that way. I think my writing it all down is the first step to finding out more and being able to share our story with more people all over the world. These things really do happen to regular people, and we don't know why we were chosen, why at that time, in that place. We don't know anything at all except for our experiences. He doesn't know I'm sharing this, but with all of the research he does, you'll more than likely come across it one day. I'm not sure how he will react, but for me, it's been very therapeutic, and I thank you for letting me get it off my chest. On to the next one. I had been out with friends. We were running around playing Ding Dong Ditch and had finished with our mischief for the night. It was probably around 10 or 10.30, and I needed to get home. I had lived in the area for eight years or so, and was very familiar with all of the back trails and the ways to get around off the main, albeit dirt road. The area I lived in was a resort carved out of a group of swampy lakes by a developer about 20 years before. It was fairly built up, but with large swaths of forest between many of the homes. In addition, Since many of the homes were used as weekend and summer cottages, the area was sparsely populated from early fall until spring. I walked home alone that night, and at one point had to make a decision about whether or not to follow the road or go up a path that would cut about ten minutes off my walking time. I knew I was running late, and curfew was coming up soon, so I chose to go up the path which ran along a ridge to a low hill about 200 yards from a swampy lagoon off of one of the main lakes. I was pretty familiar with this pathway, now a full road, because I would take it in the daytime with my bike and occasionally stop to pick wild strawberries that grew there in abundance. I vividly remember stopping at the trailhead and trying to see into the woods. There was no moon, and since this area was well away from any light sources, it was pitch black. For some reason, I was a little jumpy about walking down the path night. I even remember walking about 10 yards down the trail 
and walking back out for some reason. I figured it was just because it was so dark. I figured I was just being jumpy unnecessarily and walked in. The path was about a quarter of a mile long and at the end ran down a steep hill. My house was about 200 yards from the end of the trail and just on the other side of the finger of the lagoon off the lake. About three quarters of the way into the trail, I walked up on something. I am still not sure what, since I could not see anything. About twenty or thirty feet directly in front of me was a very loud and piercing scream that made me jump completely out of my skin. The scream was followed by a loud crashing as whatever it was ran down the hill through the woods toward the lake. Whatever it was covered the distance through the woods in only a couple of seconds and in very few bounds. Needless to say, I did not stick around and tore off down the trail, down the hill and to my house as fast as I could go. I to this day do not know what I encountered. I still remember the scream and it sounds very similar to the sound of a woman's scream. It was very high pitched and very loud. I have told myself time and time again that I just walked up on a deer, but the scream did not seem like anything that would have come from a deer. I'd love to hear opinion on what it is I ran across. I don't know what happened that night. I never noticed anything unusual during the day. That night, however, some sense was telling me not to walk down the path. There was some talk of Bigfoot when I was a kid out by some swampy areas around Chip Hills High School, but I was unsure of what became of it. The sighting was around 10 or 10.30. It was a clear night with no moon. It was on a trail about 8 to 10 feet wide. I assume it used to be an old logging road of some kind. It was abandoned, and the floor of it was very sandy, unlike the surrounding forest. It was very quiet to walk on, since there was very little vegetation, except for wild strawberries that grew everywhere. The trail was a couple of hundred yards away from a swampy lagoon, with some houses around it. However, there were only two houses that contained year-round residents. On to the next one. Hello, my name is Bill, and I had an uncomfortable interaction with a Sasquatch nearly 30 years ago while I was fly fishing in Montana. I'm retired now, but back when I was working, I was allowed four weeks of paid leave each year. It was customary for me to use one of those weeks on fly fishing excursions, and I would always do it solo because I realized at a young age that it was the most efficient way for me to clear my head. My wife was always very supportive of it because she also believed that it helped me to be less grumpy. I was about halfway through my week-long getaway and was doing some early morning fishing when I noticed something out of my peripheral. The thing stood maybe 70 yards downstream from me, and at first I thought it was a very tall guy who was wearing mud-covered clothing. Initially, it didn't seem to pay any attention to me as it reached its hands into the water and pulled a few things out to feed on. I'm still unsure as to what it was taking from the water, but I could see that it wasn't fish. After watching it for a few seconds, I began to smell a nasty odor that, I believe, in having come from the creature. The smell reminded me of a homeless man who hadn't showered in weeks or even months and it seemed to grow worse by the second. The more I thought about it, the more I realized it didn't make a whole lot of sense for a homeless guy to have traveled out to that desolate location. Unless the man was highly skilled at surviving in the wilderness, he would never make it out there. I then noticed that the movements of the man were quite wild, even animalistic. Something about it all seems so out of the ordinary. I became so confused by what I was looking at. The fact that I had no previous interest in Bigfoot or Sasquatch didn't exactly help the situation. Truly, I didn't have the slightest clue 
about what was standing in that river, as I knew the shape of the figure to be far different than that of a bear. If it hadn't been for the distance and the fact I have poor eyesight, I would have right away seen that it was no human that had walked into the river. The sun was glaring at the time of this encounter. Combining that with my lack of vision made it even more difficult to perceive much detail on the guy from where I stood. Out of sheer curiosity, I walked around a bit, adjusting my position so that I could get an improved view. I assumed that the sound of the river would have muffled the sound of me trudging through the water, but the figure suddenly turned in my direction. Something about its body language implied that I should not dare to come any closer. I got the hint and turned to walk further up the river, and that was when I heard the horrible howl. I used the word howl, but I get what people mean when they say these things can scream like a wounded woman, only with ten times the volume. The noise was so aggressive that I thought it was for sure about to chase after me. But when I looked over my shoulder, the thing was still in the same place and staring directly at me. I remained in the knee-deep water as I slowly walked away and I have this feeling that if I went onto land, it would come after me in a heartbeat. It seemed far wiser to remain in the water and walk against the current. After I took a few more steps, I turned around on the creature's whereabouts, but it was gone. I was able to take my first big, deep breath because I thought I was in the clear. As I turned around to resume my walk upstream, I saw the creature at ten o'clock standing on the ground near the edge of the water. The way it stared at me still makes me quiver. It had such a blank stare, leaving me without any clue as to what his intentions were. I didn't know what else to do other than stay put, awkwardly standing there with my fishing pole in hand. I remember feeling like I would do anything to get out of that situation, to disappear from that area and teleport to my favorite chair in my living room. I can't tell you how long I stood there, but soon a man-made noise entered the vicinity. I saw the creature look up in the sky as a helicopter came into view. I couldn't tell who the helicopter belonged to, but it didn't look to be one affiliated with military or law enforcement. Still, the appearance of the aircraft was enough to persuade the creature to head for cover. It made me wonder whether it was merely trying to hide from additional eyes, or if it had had confrontations with people inside helicopters in the past. Since my exit out of the area was in the opposite direction of the section of the woods that the creature ran into, I speculated if I should head out of the water and make a run for it. Before I knew it, the helicopter was already at the horizon, yet I was still in the water, internally debating how I should proceed. Eventually, I concluded that waiting in the water to see if the creature returned was probably the worst idea. Sure, someone might come down the river in a boat, but there was no guarantee of that. I thought the best thing I could do was to walk toward the path as quietly and calmly as possible. As I got on the trail, I would casually look over my shoulder every once in a while, hoping to reassure myself that the creature wasn't following me. The moment that I stepped into my rental car and locked the doors was quite possibly the most soothing moment of my life. I took a few glorious moments to thank the Lord for not only helping me make it safely to the car, but for sending the helicopter to deter the creature from pursuing me. I was in such an isolated location that my rental car was the only one in the parking area. As I began to drive out of the lot and toward the road, I checked the rearview mirror and saw a face watching me from within the edge of the forest. I have no way of knowing with certainty, but I'm confident that it was the same creature from earlier. Like so many others, I long for an explanation for what these things are. Are they more human, or are they more ape? I'll go ahead and say I think they're some kind of wild man. 
The reason they're so big and bulky is probably due to the harsh environment they have to survive in. It might not even be a thing of evolution. Maybe God put the species on this earth like he did with all the other organisms. I have to agree that there is something so very off-putting about them. It's like they're from an entirely separate universe. Hell, if I hadn't had that disturbing experience, I never would have guessed something like it was out there. I dearly hope that we will one day receive an official explanation for what they are and why they're here. On to the next one. My name's Oren, and I come from a long line of musicians. My grandfather played cello with the Boston Philharmonic, and my grandmother played harp for private events, you know, like weddings and such, all in Boston. Their daughter, my mom, played piano and later harp, then moved to Montana for college, of all places, where she met my dad. My dad's side was also musical, but... They came from the Missouri Ozarks and had their own ideas about the subject. My dad played dobro and guitar. I'm always amazed when I think of how different my mom and dad were, but they say opposites attract. In any case, I grew up in the middle of all of this, in rural Montana, listening to my mom play classical piano and harp and my dad played bluegrass dobro and country guitar. Oh, and he also played a mean harmonica. My older sister took lessons from my mom and became a pretty good pianist herself, sometimes playing for school events, church, that kind of thing, but never professionally. I grew up refusing to play anything, always the rebel, though I did once threaten to take up bagpipes when my mom wouldn't leave me alone about taking lessons. But I always liked music, as long as it wasn't classical or bluegrass or folk. I hated folk. So what did that leave? Rock and roll, baby. But the closest I ever got to playing rock and roll was on my stereo. If they had an award for disappointing your parents, I'd be first in line. I not only refused to play an instrument, I also refused to go to college, and my dad didn't really care as he dropped out of college and was a lineman, but it basically killed my mom, for she had a university education, as did her entire family. Like I said, how those two ever got together is a mystery. Instead of being a doctor or such like my mom wanted, I became a Finnish carpenter. I love working with wood. And there are a lot of nice houses near Kalispell with beautiful custom cabinets and such that have my signature on them. Well, not literally, but my work really stands out. I hope I don't sound like a braggart, but I guess I still feel a little insecure about not being a professional with a college degree, thanks to my mom, though I love her dearly. Oh, and my fifth became a dentist, so... I should thank her too, I guess. But I was the one who got to live on the edge of some of the most beautiful, wild country in the United States, maybe all of North America, because I built my own house on 80 acres I'd bought back before things got so expensive. Where was it? Right on the boundary of Glacier National Park, near West Glacier, Montana. I got to live in a landscape that a lot of people only dream of. My wife and I had a house that wasn't just beautiful inside, but beautiful in every direction you looked. It was like living in a landscape painting. My sis lives in a fancy subdivision in Denver with her neighbor spent for a view. Living close to nature is good for you. When I die, I want my obituary to read something like he always lived in the most beautiful places, just like the one for the famous artist Russell Chatham Red. Chatham also lived in Montana. Well, they say you always eventually go home, and when you get older, I think it's true. You go back to what you grew up with, and for me, that was music. 
I was in my early 40s, and I'd finally got the place where I could afford to take some time off now and then. My wife, Becky, worked in the building office of a medical clinic, and her income gave us some stability, so I didn't worry when I was between jobs. Actually, my work was more and more in demand as wealthy people discovered the area, and I was keeping really busy. I just finished a big job, an expensive house owned by a celebrity singer down in the lakeside, and I needed a break. So I took a month off and just kicked back, taking it easy, working on some projects around the house, cooking a lot. I love to cook, cleaning, and doing the laundry, and taking care of our two kids. Though being in high school, neither required much care. Becky got to where she hoped I wouldn't go back to work, as she now had a house husband, but after a week, I started getting bored. One day, I'd gone down to Calis Bell for something or other, and I happened to notice a pawn shop. I'm all for a bargain, so I went inside, and there, lo and behold, was a violin. I stood there, dumbfounded, as a whole host of feelings came from nowhere. Feelings of nostalgia and of visiting my grandparents in their big old Boston house when I was a kid, them serenading us on the cello and harp. I didn't even think about it. I just bought the darn thing and walked out the door, no idea what I was going to do with it. Well, what I did with it was become obsessed. I guess all those musical genes raised their ugly head because all I wanted to do was learn to play that darn violin. I couldn't read a lick of music, so I took it up by ear, and I will say I seemed to have a bit of talent for it, as it came pretty easily, and I knew violin wasn't an easy instrument to learn. But I didn't want to learn to play violin. I wanted to learn to play the fiddle. For all practical purposes, they're the same instrument, the terms just referring to how you play it. Violin is classical, while fiddle is bluegrass. Growing up in rural Montana, you don't hear much classical music, and there can be a bit of a highbrow association with it. And even though I seemed to be going back to my musical roots, I had no intention of playing classical, as I hadn't lost my mind, not yet anyway. It was too hard and too stuffy and formal for my taste. I just wanted to play fiddle. I'd apparently lost my dislike of bluegrass. I bought a couple of books, but I don't remember even reading them. I just practiced and practiced. Well, as far as Becky was concerned, I might have just started drinking, though fiddle playing was a lot more intrusive. I'm not saying she wasn't supportive as she was, but she was much more supportive when I didn't practice where she could hear me. So I played in the basement, spending every spare minute practicing. Maybe I would have been better off drinking, if not as noisy. Well, my wife was probably wondering what next, but she had no idea. I started getting interested in venues where people played fiddle. I say venues, but I didn't care whether it was something like the Red Ant Pants Music Festival over by White Sulphur Springs or an open mic at the local bar. I just wanted to hear other people play the fiddle and see how they did it. It was like learning a foreign language. Full immersion is the best. I started going out a lot. I think Becky at first thought I was having a midlife crisis, and maybe I was, but it wasn't your usual kind. I'd sometimes take the kids with me, or sometimes Becky would go, or I'd go alone. I didn't care. I'd talk to the musicians and see how they did things. Becky said I should get a job covering the music beat for the paper, and I was so not I actually considered it for a minute, even though I'm not much of a writer. I finally got a job doing cabinet in a new house over in Columbia Falls. But even on my break, I played that darn fiddle. I was actually getting to where I could play some tunes pretty good, or at least that's what my daughter Kim told me. Well, one evening after work, I got tired of the basement and took my fiddle out onto the back deck. Like I said, we had 80 acres, and it was mostly thick timber, but you could see the tall mountains of glacier in the distance. While out there playing, 
I felt different. I realized I felt free and unfettered. And after that, I'd play out on the deck as long as the weather allowed, even at night. You can probably see where this is going. Playing out in nature. I was sure to become a curiosity of whatever was around, and that's exactly what happened. Animals are smart, and it behooves them to know what's in their environment. They're naturally curious. I found that if I played during the day, the squirrels and birds would come around as if to listen. In the evening, it would be the deer and an occasional fox or coyote, but I wasn't really prepared for what eventually came around. I like Irish music, and I was getting to where I could play some jigs and reels and that kind of thing. Irish music is hard to play, so I must have been getting better. A lot of bluegrass has its origins in Irish and Scottish music. Part of what I liked about it was that it was so lively and fun. So, I'd be out there in our back deck, stomping around and playing some enthusiastic bluegrass, all caught up in it, and then look up to see I had an audience. A couple of deer, maybe a few blue jays, a rabbit, that kind of thing, though usually not at the same time. If the weather was nice, I'd sometimes do a barbecue for dinner, and Becky and the kid would come out and listen to me play while eating. I would play quieter music then, so as to not run them off. Stuff like ballads, that same folk music I'd always hated. By then, Becky was starting to appreciate my efforts more, and she'd sit and listen, saying it was all so lovely, music out in the woods. This made me feel really good, and I started to get an inkling of why my mom's family had loved music so much. Well, barbecue and bluegrass, what could go better together? Apparently, we weren't the only ones who liked that combination. I think it was the smell of the barbecue that first brought my new audience to me. But I do think the music helped keep them around. But I'm getting ahead of myself. One evening, I'd pretty much played myself out, and it was getting late. I was sitting in one of the deck chairs, and my daughter Kim came out and joined me. We talked about school and her future plans, and life in general, and she finally told me, Dad, you're getting pretty good on that thing. I really admire your ability to focus and stick with something so hard. I was pleased to hear it, telling her that maybe someday I'd be good enough to play in front of a real audience, like at the Red Ant's Pants. She'd gone with me not long before, and we both really enjoyed it. I was surprised by her reply. Don't do it, Dad. The pressure just ruins it. That's why I quit drama. I love acting, but having an audience changes everything. It's no longer fun. I knew she'd quit her high school drama class, but I hadn't known why until then. Some people love an audience, I replied. It motivates them to do even better and creates a kind of synergy. I know, she replied, but Dad, I know you too well. You're not going to like it. Like you always tell us, know thyself. Ah, the wisdom of children. I wish I'd listened, but instead, a seed had been planted. I wanted to join a group. Maybe I actually was reliving my younger days, or at least I knew Becky thought so. Before I knew it, I'd managed to hook up with several other guys who had the same idea. We said our main goal was to have fun, but I knew that, in the back of all our minds, we wanted to play semi-professionally or at least in front of a real audience. And of course, since I lived out in the woods, it made sense for us to practice on our back deck. And man, did we have fun. We had one guy on the guitar, one on harmonica, and one on steel guitar, and me on fiddle. Our guitar player also sang. I did backup vocals, discovering that I had a pretty nice tenor voice, or at least that's what the guys told me. We do a potluck barbecue on Friday evenings after work, then play until we could play no more. It got to where their spouses, friends, kids, you name it. It would come along and eventually turn into one big party every Friday night. Well, one summer night, everyone had gone home except Wes, my buddy who played guitar, and we were sitting around in the dark, winding down and talking. 
Wes was feeling like we'd reached a dead end with the band, and he wanted to branch out. I was surprised, thinking we were just getting good, but he wanted to start playing more Western tunes. He wanted me to sing more lead, as he felt I had a good voice, and it would add variety. He said I should learn to yodel. I got a good laugh from this, I can tell you, and as we sat there talking, I felt a sense of nostalgia come over me, far awayness like I was suddenly part of something bigger than me. I looked out at the dark forest all around us, only half listening to Wes talk about some guy he'd met called Wiley who had a band called Wiley in the Wild West. They sang authentic old tunes like Cattle Call and Red River Valley. Wiley was apparently a rancher out by the High Line in the central part of the state, called that because it was the northern route of the Burlington Northern Railroad. The more West talked, the more I felt like I was being transported into a different life and time, and I could now picture myself walking with a band of people long ago like some tribe, and these were my own relatives, my own kind, and we lived in the high mountains of Glacier, and had for many millennia. It was almost like a vision. West was now going on and on about how we could do Wiley in the West kind of stuff, but I really needed to learn how to yodel, as that was part of the old Western style of singing, and I definitely had the voice for it, having a high range and all. He knew he could get us gigs, maybe even some festivals, but I wasn't listening, for I could now see some of my people standing at the forest's edge in the darkness, not far away at all, and they were somehow beckoning me to join them, saying I didn't belong where I was, and I would be much happier with them, living as I was meant to live, as my kind had for thousands, maybe millions of years. West was now irritated, and his sharp voice brought me back to reality. I assured him I'd been listening, and would consider it all. And I thought, changing from bluegrass to authentic western would be a great thing, even though I barely knew what I was saying. Wes had to go home, but suddenly I wanted him to stay. I felt like I was losing my sense of boundaries of who I was, and there was something out there I didn't understand. I, of course, didn't say anything about all this to him. I just tried to get him to talk more about yodeling, but he stood to go, saying his wife would be worrying about him if he was very late, and besides, for some reason, he felt uncomfortable out here in the dark like maybe there was a bear out there or something. I followed him inside, locking the door, then turning on the deck light. Becky was watching some TV show, and the kids were upstairs, and I wanted desperately to get everyone together, as if there was some natural disaster about to happen. I almost felt panicked. I figured it was something mental going on, maybe discomfort from Wes talking about playing in big venues and all, so I went back into the kitchen and got a beer, thinking it would settle my nerve. As I stood there, I looked out the window at the edge of the forest, and I swear, I could see eyes shining in the dark. I sometimes would see eyes shine from deer and elk and other animals if they passed through the outside light. But this was different, because it was a good six feet or more off the ground and nowhere near the light, and the eyes were red as blood. I was stunned and went back into the living room. I never drink late at night like that, and Becky noticed, asking if I was okay. I told her I felt weird and had just seen strange eyes looking at the house from the forest. She laughed and went into the kitchen to look, then came back to her TV show, saying it had to be my imagination, and maybe I shouldn't be drinking beer. I went upstairs and looked out from our bedroom window, but saw nothing. We have a nice recliner there for reading, and I crawled into that, pulled up a blanket over my face, and promptly went to sleep. I dreamed, or was it a dream, that I was again with my people, and we were traversing a large glacier, careful not to fall into a crevice, and it was all very tense. We were fleeing from something, and my mother held my hand tightly, telling me not to look back. My father was ahead of us, and he carried a spear and was dressed in a huge black robe. And it was then I looked back. In the distance was a creature with a coat, just like the robe, and I knew my father had killed one and made a coat from it. I woke up, half sick, 
and it took me forever to realize where I was. Becky was in bed, sleeping, and had left the nightlight on. I got up and quietly walked to the bedroom window, looking out against the forest, but saw nothing. It was 4 a.m., and there was no way I was going to be able to sleep. So, I went downstairs and made a pot of coffee and started a batch of cinnamon rolls. Like I said, I like to cook. It relaxed me. And boy, did I ever need relaxing after that dream. I wanted to go drink my coffee on the deck and watch the stars, which I often did when getting up early, though my normal time was around six, not four. But I was afraid, so I went back to the living room. I sat there, sipping my hot coffee, thinking, what was going on? It was then that I remembered the DNA test Becky had wanted me to take, thinking it would be fun for the kids to know more about their genetics, and I'd laughed it off, knowing there's a lot of controversy about the accuracy of such things. Becky had found it funny when mine had come back with results saying I was 4% Neanderthal. Kim had later done some research telling me that being Neanderthal wasn't at all what I thought and that a lot of people had Neanderthal genes. Archaeologists were now finding evidence that Neanderthals had been artistic and musical, and they even believed that they had blue eyes and red hair. Kim said that maybe I should be proud of my Neanderthal blood, as it maybe helped make me a better musician. I liked her theory and found it somewhat comforting. But archaeologists also believed that the Neanderthal were killed off by Homo sapiens, even though there had been some interbreeding. Was this the source of the dream? Were we fleeing from a Neanderthal? It didn't seem right. And what about the red eye shine I'd seen? Did it have anything to do with the dream? The cinnamon rolls were done and the sun was rising. So I took a roll and another cup of coffee out to the back deck. I was feeling much better now, fully awake, one good cup of coffee already in me, and a hot cinnamon roll wafting its yummy smell, and for no reason at all, I remembered what Wes said the night before. I started yodeling. Well, my idea of yodeling, I should say. What I lacked in technique, I made up for in volume. The sound reverberating off the nearby hill. I was impressed at how loud it sounded, but then again, I'd never tried yodeling off the deck before. I hoped I hadn't wakened Becky and the kids. For some reason, maybe in contrast to the dream, it felt like a new start, a new day, and I felt optimism and even joy. I was happy to not be that kid hurrying across the glacier being chased by something ominous, but instead here in beautiful Montana with a beautiful family and a nice house, stunning landscape to look at whenever I wanted. And heck, I even liked my job. Life couldn't get any better. Well, that's when the yodel came back to me. And no, it wasn't an echo. But it didn't sound human, nor was it really a yodel, but more of a strange yell coming from up the mountainside. I quickly went back inside, shocked. In all the years we'd lived there, I'd never heard anything like that. And no, it wasn't a mountain lion. I'd heard plenty of those, as well as bobcat screams and even bears and coyotes making strange noises, as well as odd-sounding birds. I again thought of the dream, and I somehow wondered if it was related. I again had the urge to gather my family and our two cats and flee, but now it was broad daylight, so it had nothing to do with the strange night fears. Becky was now up, having coffee in a roll, and I asked her if she'd heard anything. She hadn't, but wanted to go out on the deck and listen, intrigued by my description. And of course, we heard nothing out there at all. But we did have a nice discussion about moving into town, one instigated by me. Becky said I needed to get out of the house. And since it was a Saturday, once the kids were up, we all went into Kalispell, where we had lunch and did a little shopping out at the mall north of town. I wanted to drive around a few neighborhoods, which made Becky realize that I was somewhat serious about moving. I found several places I liked, but none had the views and the privacy our place had. But now, Becky started getting into the idea, as if it would make work much closer for her as she worked there in town. 
the kids were more hesitant, as it would mean changing school. Though neither had long until they were in college, and Kalispell has a community college they could both attend for the first two years, saving a bundle on tuition and other costs. The idea was beginning to gel, and all because of red eyeshine, a dream, and an odd yell, none of which had been more than 24 hours earlier. I thought of all the work I put into our place, all the custom this and that, and I started feeling a sense of regret for having said anything. But we lived in the same place since before the kids were born, and we could get a fortune for it, especially with all that land, so maybe it wasn't such a bad idea. But now Becky was saying something about how maybe we should leave Montana and try someplace new where we could buy a ranch for what our place was worth, like Wyoming or Nebraska. I knew she was thinking of her lifelong dream to live on a ranch like the one she'd grown up on instead of dealing with Medicare and Medicaid billing and non-paying patients all day long. I couldn't believe where a weird dream and some strangeness was now heading. I loved Montana and I never wanted to leave. It was where I'd been born and raised and I was seriously regretting having said anything. Moving to a different property was one thing. But leaving Montana? That evening, back on the deck, I was looking at things with new eyes, as if I just moved there, seeing it for what it was. They say you don't appreciate what you have until it's gone, and I didn't want that to happen. I wanted to look at what we had through unbiased eyes before we made any decision. Sure, it had been my idea, but I now felt I'd been operating from a position of irrational fear. I surveyed the scene, a beautiful, pristine forest with wildlife galore, many who came to visit in the evening hours unafraid. There were a number of animal trails we could walk in total peace and privacy, though we didn't go out there as much as we'd done when the kids were little, exploring and enjoying nature. And we even had our own small stream that coursed down through the forest from the big hills above. If I stood up or looked out from the upstairs window, I could even see some of the high peaks in Glacier National Park towering high above with their snow-capped tops, a sight many would pay a fortune to have. And it was all so peaceful. And what about the house? I'd built it with my own two hands while Becky and I lived in a small trailer. The cabinets were custom birch, and the ceilings were custom woods from a reclaimed flour mill over on the plain. Everything was handmade, and based on the praise I'd received over the years, well done. How could we ever sell it? I felt a poignancy, a feeling that something important was about to be lost, and I went back inside. I needed to talk to Becky. But when I saw her on her computer looking at some land agency listings, I felt selfish and defeated. Maybe we should move for her sake. Sure, I'd built up a reputation as a Finnish carpenter, but I could rebuild that, even if we weren't in a well-heeled place. Becky had always been there for me, working hard at a job she really didn't like, and maybe it was time to give her a break. I just couldn't believe how fast things were moving. That night, I had another dream. I was no longer a child, but I was still with my people, and now I was the one wearing the dark skin. I didn't really want to wear it, but my father was dead, killed by one of the black creatures. I now had to follow tradition and wear the robe. And now, that creature's kin wanted to kill me. I could hear them in the nearby forest, talking in their strange language, and I knew they were coming for me. All I wanted was to stop this killing and retribution. Why couldn't we live in peace? We were different, yet we had many similarities. We had language, loved our families, and ate the same plants and fish and small animals. It seemed like we had so much in common, so why fight? And I somehow knew my species would win in the end, decimating theirs. And this made me sad, even though they'd killed my father. I knew there were no Neanderthals. Then, still dreaming, I wondered, did they have music? Did their brains process the same way ours did? Could their ears hear the many changes in pitch ours did? 
I read that humans can easily detect frequency as fine as one twelfth of an octave, a half step in musical terminology, but predatory species such as dogs can only discriminate one third of an octave, and even our primate relatives could only hear changes of half an octave. Were these black creatures primates like us? They had to be. Maybe music could be our common language, a way to communicate our fears and dreams to each other, and then we stopped fighting. I now dreamed that I took out a simple flute I'd carved and started playing, but they were still stalking me, and I stopped playing getting my spear ready. I woke, immediately knowing I'd been dreaming, and yet afraid anyway. It all seemed too real, but Becky was beside me, sound asleep. It was 4 a.m., just like before. I quietly got up and slipped on my clothes and went downstairs to the kitchen, again making coffee. We still had some scones from the bakery in Kalispell the day before, so I grabbed one and went back on the deck, even though it was still pitch dark. I knew I had to confront my fears. And there, again, like before, was something standing at the edge of the tree line, something with glowing red eyes. I was scared to death and went back inside, but then I decided to get my fiddle. The dream had planted a thought. Could music be a bridge between different species? I didn't even know what species I was looking at, but it was worth a try. Instead of running like a scared rabbit, I would give it a shot. I began playing quietly so as to not wake Becky and the kids, but hopefully loud enough that whatever was out there would hear me. It started out with an old Scottish song about a heather in the highland and pining for a lost love, then segued into a beautiful Robert Burns song with Gaelic lyrics I didn't understand, something about calling the sheep. I next thought of Wes and his desire to play old cowboy songs, so I played the song called Twilight on the trail and then went into an old tune called Rose Blossom Special. I must say I surprised myself at how many songs I actually knew. And as I played, I wondered if whatever was out there would hear the things the same way I did. Maybe they hated music and would run away. When I finally looked up, the eye shy was gone, but in its place were three shadows. And I thought at first they were bears, but soon realized I was looking at the same type of creature I'd seen in my dream. They were much closer, seemingly entranced by my playing. It was almost dawn, just light enough to see them, and even though I knew I should be afraid, I wasn't, for I knew they wouldn't harm me. They nodded their heads as if asking for more. So I stood and played my heart out. Every song I knew, from Marty Rahman to Blue Rodeo to Driftwood Holly and songs I've now long forgotten. As the sun rose, they faded back into the trees, gone like a dream, and later that night, once it was again dark, I went back out into the deck to find a beautiful bunch of colorful river stones on the steps, and I somehow knew they'd left them. That same day, I called a land conservation agency and asked about putting most of our land into a perpetual conservancy and leaving only a couple of acres out for the house. I was worried that it would greatly decrease the amount we'd get from the property, but the guy said it usually had the opposite effect and that it made it more desirable because the taxes were much lower and people liked knowing it would never be developed. I talked to Becky, and she was all for it, so we proceeded. After that was put into place, our next step was to call a real estate agent and list the property. We were both astounded by what they suggested we list it for. Because it backed to Glacier National Park, it was worth a fortune and we had several offers the week it was listed. After we sold it, I was sitting on the back deck one last time. As we would leave the next morning, most of our stuff already moved, the place we'd rented in Kalispell until we could decide where to go next. I'd left the band, no longer having any desire to play for an audience, or who could ever best the one I just played for. There on the deck, I took out my fiddle and played an old Bob Marley tune singing quietly, Every little thing's going to be all right. I sat for a while, enjoying the quiet, then went inside, turning off the deck light for the last time.
on to the next one. My name is Cindy, and I used to live in Fairbanks, Alaska. My husband, at the time, were now divorced, always wanted a remote cabin in the Alaskan outback. It was a dream he'd had since before we met. He was a highly stressed oil executive, and I think this represented a sort of freedom to him, a return to his childhood days when he and his family lived near Lake Tahoe. So, he finally got to the position financially where he could make this dream come true. And he did. He went and bought a parcel of land, and it was truly remote. You could only get in there with a bush plane, a float plane. This is not unusual in that part of Alaska. I met my husband flying. I'm a bush pilot, so my job for the project was to get us in and out of there, along with supplies for this new undertaking, this cabin. We had spent hours on this plan, but it was a modest cabin because we were limited by the supplies we could get in there. We spent a lot of time camping on the site. It was by a large lake, and we'd walk around and picture this and that until we decided where we wanted the cabin. But I should have known something serious was up there when Dell, my husband, decided suddenly to change the plan. It had to be close enough that we could easily reach the plane, yet we wanted some trees around it for ambiance. But Dell now changed his mind and wanted the cabin right by the lake, where we could easily reach the plane. This happened after I had flown back into town to get more supplies, as we decided to stay an extra week and when I came back, Dell was acting weird. He seemed nervous, and when I asked him about it, he said he'd seen what he thought was a grizzly. But there was something strange about it. It had walked on two feet. Bears will sometimes do this, so we talked about it, and Dell just couldn't seem to calm down. So we decided to leave. On the way out, he told me he wanted the cabin right next to the lake. I had no problem with that, but it was just the beginning. We flew back in a week later, and Dell spent some time walking around the area looking for tracks. He said he wanted to know if the grizzlies had been around. He didn't find anything, but it seemed like he was still very nervous, always looking over his shoulder. He didn't sleep well in the tent. In fact, he ended up trying to sleep in the plane. At that point, I told him we needed to reassess this whole thing. If he was that nervous about bears, maybe we should just drop the entire idea. He seemed to come back around and get it together. He wanted that cabin. It was his childhood dream, and no bear was going to deny him that. So, back to the plan. But he then decided he would make it a bear-proof cabin. He redesigned it to be really strong, with big logs and a lot of reinforcement. We were going to have a logging crew come in and cut the log on our land for the cabin. This was not a quick project, as the logs would have to cure before we could even use them. We had the logs cut, and the cabin looked to be substantial in thickness and construction, if not in size. It was then that Dell announced we wouldn't have regular windows, as Bear could knock out the glass and get in. I agreed, but wasn't prepared for his new idea. The cabin would have windows like you'd see in old castles, sort of cross-shaped like for crossbows, and narrow only a foot or so wide. We wouldn't have to carry as much glass in that way, he said, and nothing could get in. The next change of plan was to add a second story with a deck so he could see all around and enjoy the countryside without actually being away from the cabin. It was almost like being prisoner. I thought, but I didn't say anything. At this point, I was beginning to think this whole idea was getting crazy. I had yet to see one grizzly there, but I knew they were around and could be dangerous. But why live somewhere you were scared all the time? 
I told him we should maybe consider a cabin in Colorado or somewhere there weren't grizzlies. But he said we were already into this, and he'd see it through. Plus, he wanted a place close enough he could come on the weekend. Colorado was too far. He had the money to have a cabin wherever he wanted, and this was the place. It was finally the next spring, and construction began. I flew a couple of the log house builders in and supplied them. They had a big cabin tent to live in, and they figured it would easily take the two of them all summer to get the logs up. Dell and I would go out there on weekends and check on them and resupply them. It was a truly beautiful spot, and it was beginning to be fun watching the cabin take shape. We'd camp on the weekend, and Dell seemed much more relaxed with more people around. We'd sit by the campfire in the evenings and tell tales, roast marshmallows, swat mosquitoes, that sort of thing. Finally, by midsummer, the shell was taking shape, and it was becoming more clear what the building would look like. I was starting to get excited, even though it wouldn't be until next summer that we could use it. Dell's attitude was completely changing also. He was now comfortable around the area and had apparently forgotten the bears. Even though the workers had seen a couple in the distance, they were of course well armed, the workers, not the bears. If you spend much time in the Alaska outback, you're going to see grizzlies. And you're wise to be armed. Well, one day I got a call on my satellite phone. It was Joe one of the construction guys out at the site. He said we needed to get out there ASAP. He wouldn't tell me why. Just to get the heck out there, he said. It was an emergency. Dell was gone. He was at a meeting in Washington, trying to work with a lobbyist about something to do with the oil business. I really didn't want to go out there alone. But it sounded urgent. At this point, I knew the guys really well. They were very credible and trustworthy, and Joe was not mincing words. But I called my buddy Simon and had him go out there with me. He was a fellow bush pilot. I didn't know what I would find, and I might need help. I knew something was wrong the minute we landed on the lake. I could see both of the guys on the shore, ready to go. They were carrying their rifles. They waded out to the plane a bit, running, and I barely had time to shut the prop off before they were on board. They both said to get the heck out of there, now, as fast as we could. But I wanted to inspect the site and see what they'd done. They refused to get out of the plane and told me we had to go. It was a dangerous situation. We needed to get the heck out of there right then and now. There was a real sense of urgency, so I took back off. They were fine so it wasn't something medical. I did decide to circle over the cabin site, and my eyes couldn't believe what I saw. Half of the building had been raised to the ground. I mean, it looked like a tornado had struck it. Logs were scattered around like matchsticks, and these were heavy, big logs. The guy had used a makeshift crane to raise them, and the rest of the building was being demolished as we flew above it. As I flew in a circle, I could see several large, dark brown creatures pushing down walls and tearing everything up. Their strength and fury was unbelievable, and as we flew over, they looked up and we could see their faces. These weren't bears at all. They looked human, except for their size and hair all over. They also looked enraged. Sasquatch, said Joe. Now, let's get the heck out of here. Go back to Fairbank. If we came back down, they'd kill us. On the way back to Fairbank, Joe and his partner Larry told a story of how they had at first heard sounds in the forest. At first distant, then closer and closer, like wood knocking on wood. This went on for a couple of days, and the two had been so unnerved by it that they took turns on guard while the other slept. They had been unable to work for fear and for a feeling of being watched. Remember, we're out in the Alaskan outback, 
one of the most remote places on Earth. Finally, the wood knocking had turned into vocalization during the night. Joe swore he had heard what sounded like monkey chatter and later deep growls. He described the growls as having a lot of volume, like something with a huge chest. He also heard what sounded like some kind of conversation, but he couldn't make out the word. It was nonsensical to him, kind of like some oriental language. They were afraid of grizzlies, but grizzlies didn't play games with their prey like these animals seemed to be doing, which made them much scarier. Next, the growls turned into rocks being thrown. The two had made it through the night, terrified, rocks landing on their tent roof and causing it to sag. But by daylight, things had quieted down. They were feeling braver and decided to investigate. That's when they found the footprint and knew exactly what they were dealing with. Sasquatch. Now, they were even more terrified. They tried to call me to try to get them out, but they couldn't get through, even with a sat phone. They spent the entire day trying to call while gathering discarded logins for a fire. The Sasquatch seemed to be sleeping, as there was no activity during the day. The next night was spent in true fear. Fear they would never get out alive, and fear that comes from hearing huge logs being thrown through the air. The Sasquatch were destroying the cabin. A couple of times, they could hear something near their tent, and they would shoot their rifles, and it would then retreat back into the night. They had decided not to actually shoot at anything, as the last thing they needed was an enraged, wounded Sasquatch and friends enacting revenge. Not telling if their rifles would even make a dent in something that big, an animal big enough to throw logs around. They kept a big bonfire burning all night right outside their tent. By morning, they had been able to get a signal and called me. The Sasquatch hadn't seemed to notice them as the two went to the edge of the lake, where they hid behind rocks, rifles ready, waiting until they saw me come in. They had been afraid the Sasquatch would swim out to the plane and try to wreck it, which they could have easily done, so... They were relieved when they got on board and we took off. When we got back to Fairbanks and landed, they both quit on the spot, and I paid them. I also reimbursed them for the cabin tent they'd left behind. I figured Dell and I could go back out there and get all their gear. I had no idea how he would take this, but I knew it would mean the end of the project. When Dell got back, I told him about what had happened, and he seemed obsessed with talking to Joe and Larry, which he did. He then told me he'd seen a Sasquatch on day one. That's why he'd been so nervous. But he hadn't trusted his eyes. Now, he refused to go back out to the site. I was also scared. I had already seen the Sasquatch and the power they had. But I really wanted to go get our gear. We had left some nice equipment out there. But... I couldn't find anyone who would go with me. Even my pilot friend Simon refused and tried to talk me out of going. So I decided to go alone. Maybe it was stupid, but I somehow felt that Sasquatch had probably already destroyed everything and left. It was now two weeks later, and I could circle around and check it out, see if I spotted anything before landing. I was born and raised in Alaska, and I have a sort of determination that comes from having to make do. I wanted the nice tools that had been left out there, plus the camping gear. It was expensive stuff. Dell was beside himself. He threatened to divorce me if I went. My feelings were that he should at least have come with me to offer protection while I collected the gear, but he wouldn't do it. In retrospect, he was the smarter of the two of us in this case. Like I said, we soon divorced, but it really had little to do with that. It had more to do with differing worldviews and incompatibilities. Ironically, he now lives in a cabin in Colorado. I took my bear rifle with me and also a handgun. When I got there, I circled several times looking for bears or Sasquatch. At that point, I was scared to death. I decided to go through with it. I'd flown clear out there. 
The cabin was totally destroyed. Nothing stood, just logs thrown about. I looked for the tent. It was gone. Then I saw what looked to be shreds of it all over. This was bad, but maybe I could at least get a few of the tools and such. They'd been using a Brunton level I really wanted. It had belonged to my dad and had sentimental value. I landed on the lake. The Sasquatch must have heard me coming, although I didn't know it. I got out of the plane and anchored it, then jumped on shore. I would work quickly, get the level first, be on guard, get out fast. It suddenly dawned on me that I was taking my life into my hand foolishly, just for an old level, and my dad would not have been happy about that. But I continued, kind of compelled actually, I went to the campsite, and sure enough, the tent was completely gone, but shreds of canvas were here and there. I had my digital camera, and I took photos. There was literally nothing there to retrieve. Everything was gone. The guys had left their personal stuff, clothes, cook set, etc., and nothing was there. The Sasquatch had taken it, apparently. I was on guard, watching as I went, half scared to death. I then went to the cabin site, looking for the level, and some of the expensive tools. Nothing. I couldn't find anything worth retrieving, but the photos were worth the trip, I decided. Dell wouldn't believe it. I suddenly saw something reflecting in the sun. It was my dad's level, half buried under debris. This was a hand level, a very nice old-fashioned one. And I was very happy to have it back. But now... Just as suddenly as I'd spotted the level, I felt an indescribable and sudden urge to get back on the plane, a fight-or-flight feeling. I was being watched. The hair on my neck stood up. I drew my handgun. I'd left the rifle in the plane, and it was too bulky to carry while trying to collect stuff. I slowly turned in a circle, assaying the situation. I saw nothing, but... I somehow knew they were there. I felt foolish, terrified, stupid to have come back. I now began walking back to the plane, constantly looking around me. There were trees and big rocks everywhere. Each could have a Sasquatch behind it, and I had to cut through a part of the forest to get back to the plane, as a small shore cliff prevented me from taking a straight path. Why had I come back? Would anyone ever find me? Now, I could hear them coming. I could hear wood knocking in the trees to my left, and then to my right, very close. I wanted to run, but instinct said to not show fear. I carefully made my way through a group of large boulders, then entered the small grove of trees. I had to cut through to get back. I could hear footsteps. I was being followed and close. I could turn and face them, and shoot, or keep going, and try to get back quickly before they decided to attack, if they were going to. I decided to just keep going. I've read a lot about Bigfoot since then, and I've read they aren't as territorial around women as men. Maybe they decided I wasn't a threat because they never showed their faces. I did hear some monkey chatter, or what sounded like it. I was soon on the plane and out of there. I never felt so happy in my life to be off that lake. What really freaked me out was when I got back and downloaded the photos on my computer. Dell was looking at them. He just couldn't believe the destruction. But after a while, he got even more interested and started zooming in on things. Every single picture I took had at least one set of eyes in it, eyes that glowed red, eyes in the trees in the background, and these guys were huge, at least seven or eight feet off the ground, every single one of them. Dell figured, based on the number of photos I took, that there were at least six or seven Sasquatch right there when I was wandering around. That still gives me the chills. After we divorced, I took a job at a flight school as an instructor as far from the Alaskan outback as I could get. 
in Tucson, Arizona. Bigfoot blamed for trouble near East Michigan town, Yale, Michigan. Cindy Barone says it's not the torn down fences or the barn doors that have been ripped off at the hinges, nor is it the high pitched screaming her family often hears at night. It is the unknown that scares us, she said. If I knew what it was, I could deal with it. The rural, St. Clair County woman is referring to a large, hairy creature that she and her family are convinced of is a Sasquatch or Bigfoot. A creature that is said to walk on two legs and roam the wooded areas from Maine to Washington. While there is no documented proof of the existence of Bigfoot, films have been made that supposedly show the creature fleeing into a forest. The Barone's latest encounter with the beast came Friday evening at their East Michigan farm when their daughter Trina, 13, and Roxanne, 12, went out to the barn to check on their animals. Trina said the horses were spooked, and when she reached for the light switch in the pitch-black barn, she felt them fur. At first, I thought it was a goat or something, so I took my glove off and I touched it again, she said. But, she said, the beast stood two feet above her, glaring down with bright red eyes. Trina said she didn't know what the animal was. I have no idea, she said. All I know is that the fur was about one inch thick and all matted and dirty. Wayne King, the founder and head of the Michigan Canadian Bigfoot Information Center, said this is the first report in which a human has made physical contact with a Sasquatch. Miss Barone, 33, said the family's first encounter with the animal came in September. Since then, fences have been torn down a number of times, and animals spook frequently, she said. On to the next one. In rural St. Clair County in Michigan, Cindy Barone saw the Bigfoot again. The creature would sit in front of the barn facing the house so that it could look at the house. It was after apples or grain molasses and bags had been broken into. On to the next one. Kathy Hensley's dog were barking at 6.15 a.m. in Lexington in Fanley County in Michigan. Kathy went outside and the light of the porch saw an animal over six feet tall standing on its hind legs and throwing her German Shepherd dog, which fortunately survived the attack. This was only 10 miles from the Brown sighting in St. Clair County, which occurred around the same time. A nine-foot-tall Bigfoot was seen on Fort Custer Recreation Area near the Kalamazoo River. Witnesses included a reception supervisor and a state trooper who saw it on a frozen pond. On to the next one. In Grand Traverse County in Michigan, it was back in the woods off the highway on a two-track dirt road. I guess some logging had been done back where we were at. My stepbrother took me and one of my friends out on a camping trip up by Traverse City, Michigan. We were going to rough it out in the woods, no tent, just sleeping bags. On our way up, he told us of an encounter he had a couple of years ago while camping with some friends out in the woods. They had just came back from town and were sitting around a campfire when something started yelling and rustling around in the woods. It was moving around the perimeter of their campsite. They ended up leaving and never went back for their tent or camping supplies. We decided to head to the same area he had camped at the years earlier. The dirt road that led back into the woods was very rugged, and it took us about 15 to 20 minutes to reach the area. There was a clearing in the woods where we parked, and we walked around for a good area to camp. We made a fire pit and picked fiddlehead ferns to lay our sleeping bags on top of. Later that night, probably around two or three, 
my friend woke us up and said there is something out in the woods walking around our camp area. My stepbrother and me told him it was just his imagination and to go back to sleep. Around five, he woke us up again and said, Guys, there is really something out there. So we listened, and we heard something messing with my stepbrother's car. We decided to wait until the sun came up to go investigate. We got up and headed to the car. About 30 yards out from our campsite, we noticed that something had made a path through the fiddlehead ferns, and it encircled our campsite. These ferns were thigh-high, and it looked as if someone had been walking on them all night. Very weird. When we got to the car, everything looked all right, so we decided to look around the area, and that is when we found a huge footprint on the dirt road. It was a sandy area. The footprint was around 16 or 17 inches long and about 7 inches across, and it left a deep impression. We were like Bigfoot. We were pretty freaked out and kind of in shock for a few minutes. We looked around some more and found another footprint by the creek. I believe to this day that it was a Bigfoot that we had encountered that night. I have told this story to many people over the years, and I get a chill down my back every time. I also noticed something had made a circle in the fiddlehead ferns around our campsite about 30 yards out. We found large footprints, one on the dirt road and another by a creek bed. My stepbrother had an encounter in the same area a couple of years earlier and told me and my friend that he had heard of others who had encounters in the area. It was at night time, mild temperature, and no moon. I hope you enjoyed those encounters, and if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!